Но если это правда, я хочу, чтобы Путин, все его окружение, Путина, путинские друзья, его правительство знали, что они повесут за то, что они сделали с нашей страной, с моей семьей и с моим мужем ответственность. И этот день наступит очень скоро. И я хочу призвать все мировое сообщество, всех находящихся в этом зале, людей во всем мире, чтобы мы вместе сплотились и победили это зло, победили ужасающий режим, который сейчас в России. This is my video update on this Saturday afternoon, February the 17th. Let's talk about some news. And we are going to start things off with the news of Alexei Navalny's death. But uh, that is not the big story. The big story is the collapse and the retreat of the Ukraine military from Avdevka, or at least they're trying to retreat from Avdevka. At least what is left of the Ukraine military is trying to retreat from Avdevka. That is the big story. Avdevka is the big freaking story. But uh, the death of Navalny, well, it came at a time where it serves, uh, it serves as a good distraction, I guess, for, for the collective West and for uh, Elensky as he is in Munich, attending the Munich Security Conference. So uh, interesting timing there. But um, Navalny died in, uh, in prison. The official story is, at least at the moment, the official story is that he was in this, uh, this prison this penal colony, and uh, he was out walking, and he collapsed. And the, the initial report is that it was from a clot. And there's going to be an autopsy and an investigation. And everybody, everybody in a position of power around the world should not say anything until there is an investigation and an autopsy, and then everyone can come out and, and say what they need to say. But that's not what has happened. That's not what has happened at all with uh, the death of Navalny. What has happened is that the collective West, they have come out and uh, they have blamed it all on the Putin. And they blamed it on the Putin almost immediately once it was announced that Navalny had died. 15 minutes actually, 15 to 20 minutes after the announcement was made that Navalny had, uh, had died. Uh, the leaders of the collective West, they started to blame the Putin. Let me read you a post from the Russian foreign ministry, from Maria Zaharova. The reaction of Western leaders, politicians and the media to the news of the death of Navalny once again demonstrated their hypocrisy, cynicism and unprincipledness the in any situation blame Russia scheme is in action. Moreover, for each case, there is a preparation according to the manual. Let's, let's look at the chronology. This is the important part. Let's look at the chronology. Today at approximately 1419, 219, a message was published on the website of the Federal Penitentiary Service of Russia for the Yamalo Nenets Autonomous Okrug about the death of convicted Alexei Navalny in correctional colony number three. Literally 15 minutes later, a torrent of carbon copy accusations began, began pouring in. At 14.35, at 2.35, Swedish Foreign Minister Tobias Bilstrom, terrible news about Navalny, um, heinous crime from Putin, we know the, the tweets. At 14.35, the Norwegian Foreign Minister Bart Elde, the same tweets, Putin did it. Uh, 1441, Latvian Foreign Minister Edgar Vinkovich, Putin did it. Uh, 1415, Czech Foreign Minister, Putin did it. 
1451, France foreign minister, Putin did it. President uh, 1502, president of the European Council, Michel, Putin did it. 1510, uh, Elensky, Putin did it. 1516, uh, NATO, Stoltenberg, Putin did it. 1530, Moldova, Sandu, Putin did it. 1535, German foreign minister, 360, Baerbach, uh, Putin, Putin did it. Uh, 1543, Van der Van Crazy, Putin did it. Uh, 1549, Swedish Prime Minister, Putin did it. 1614, uh, Pirate Schultz, Putin did it. 1625, uh, Antony Blinky Blinken, Putin did it. Then 1728, uh, Little Napoleon Macron, Putin did it. So that's, that's basically the point that Zakharova is making. And she says some other stuff in what is a pretty... A pretty lengthy post but the point it, the point that she is making is instead of waiting for an investigation for an autopsy and investigation and then you can come out and say putin did it because even after the autopsy they're still going to come out and say putin did it at least at least wait a day or two for or three days whatever for the autopsy i mean at least give it a day or two but no 15 minutes after it was announced of his uh, of his death um, you got the, you got the tweets. Zakharova calls them carbon copy accusations. So um, a lot has been said about Navalny since his uh, his death. There's all kinds of of information now on the interwebs about Navalny, his life, who he was, who he wasn't. Uh, a lot of lot of rumors, which I guess I guess some are some are true, some are not. I mean, there's a video floating around of uh, what many people say is Navalny talking to like this MI MI six guy in Moscow, and they're talking about regime change. Uh, that's not Navalny, from what I understand. One sec, let me find out his name. It's like Navalny's right, or it was Navalny's right-hand guy. I forgot what the dude's name was. And I know, I know that I bookmarked it. Yep. Uh, Vladimir Ashurkov. Here's a tweet from uh, Dagny Taggart, Navalny's top aide, Vladimir Ashurkov. In this video is asking MI6 officer for 10 to 20 million a year to start a color revolution in Russia. That's, that's basically what was going on here. So it wasn't Navalny in that video, even though a lot of people are saying it was Navalny. That was not Navalny. That was uh, his, his right-hand guy in, in these political parties and organizations that Navalny was running. And they are talking about uh, a color revolution. They're putting a price tag on, on what it will cost for a color revolution, 10 to 20 million. 10 to 20 million dollars if you want to overthrow the Putin. That was the price back in, in uh, 2000, whenever, whenever this video was recorded, 2010 or 2015, I forgot the, the date of uh, this video recording. But, um, you know, I was in Moscow actually in uh, 2017, and I was walk walking uh, from the Pushkinskaya metro and there was a protest, a Navalny protest that was taking place, like in the in the square, the Bloshat, Pushkinskaya, and uh, it was like about maybe, I want to say like maybe a thousand, a thousand five hundred people. I would put the number at, and uh, pretty unimpressive. The police were were there, and the people were were kind of protesting. Um, they 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 weren't the most put together type of people. I remember the protesters because I remember they were like, you know, people in Moscow in general, in Moscow, especially when you walk around the city center, people, people look nice, you know, people are very well put together. And, and, and this group of people were, <laughs> were just like, yeah, it was like the type of people that you wouldn't want to run into in a, in a dark alley at night, <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's what I remember from it, but it was a pretty much a non-event. Yeah, I walked by there and I was just like, okay, it's Navalny protesters and supporters of Navalny. And that was, that was it. So I wasn't very impressed by the numbers or, or, the, or the appearance of, uh, of the people that were at this event. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, 
that was my one experience with the Navalny crew, the, the Navalny crowd. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, posts highlighting the fact that Navalny was part of the, this Yale World Fellow organization. He was part of this Yale uh, thing that's going on where I guess they, they take foreigners into, into Yale University and they, from what I imagine, they, uh, they teach them about regime change. I don't know, there must be a course at Yale. I don't know, regime change 101 or, or something. Uh, how, how, to, how to start a color revolution. I guess they teach us, they teach these courses at Yale, but um, yeah, he was part of that whole Yale club. Um, his uh, his daughter attends Stanford. Um, remember what uh, what Sergei Lavrov said about all of the the ambassadors at the UN whose kids attend Stanford, and how the U.S. kind of holds it over the parents' head that you know your kids are att are attending Stanford, so we need you to do stuff for us. Otherwise, your kids won't attend Stanford. And we know that because Michael McFowl put out a video and uh, he was buddies with Navalny. Um, and, uh, and that's not a big surprise because I guess when McFowl was ambassador, I imagine that he must have met with Navalny many times. That would just be a guess, an assumption that I'm making. And uh, he says that he was very good friends with Navalny. He was, he was speaking on Morning Joe and he's like, Putin killed him. He said it like four times in one minute. He said Putin killed him like four times. You could tell that it was, this was scripted and it was there to, to almost hypnotize the viewer, you know? Someone's going to be watching that and, and McFowl was saying Putin killed him four times. And then he'd say something after, after like 20 seconds, it goes, Putin killed him. And then he would say something 20 seconds later, Putin killed him. You can tell there, you, you, can, you can spot the propaganda and the manipulation taking place. McFowl actually was at the Munich Security Council and he actually said in his statement to Morning Joe, that uh, he had met the night before he met with uh, Navalny's wife, who's also attending the Munich Security Conference. Interesting timing there as well. So you have Alensky at the Munich Security Conference. You have Navalny's wife at the Munich Security Conference. I don't know what she's doing at the Munich Security Conference. Doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. I, I know why Alensky's there, but... Uh, why, why would Navalny's wife be there? Okay, maybe she was invited to the Munich Security Conference in order to speak about Navalny's imprisonment. I don't know. But uh, it's, it's very odd that she was at the, at the security conference. Or maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe she was invited in order to highlight Navalny's plight. It's possible. But uh, she spoke at the Munich Security Conference as well when his uh, death was announced. And uh, she said that Putin's going to be removed soon this is a very alarming statement actually from her she said that uh that i thought about what alexei would have done if it is the truth i'd like putin to know that he will be brought to justice to justice soon is the tweet from the from the account of the munich security conference yulia navalny considered traveling back to her family instead she addressed the global community and she said in her speech that uh putin is going to be going to be removed soon. So she's been told, my guess, it's just a guess, I would guess that she has been told something by the powers that be that uh, they're going to, to put together some sort of, of operation or something. They have some sort of plan to remove Putin. I'm, I'm positive there were these types of whispers and dialogue at the Munich Security Conference, no doubt about it. That would be my guess, at least, I don't know. Uh, Biden, when he spoke, <laughs> when he spoke uh, to the media yesterday on Navalny's death, um, the media asked Biden a question about, uh, first they asked him about his statement where he told Putin when he met with Putin like three, four years ago, he said, if anything happens to Navalny, you know, you're going to get the corn pop treatment uh, of Vladimir Putin. You know, he said that uh, Russia would pay a very heavy price, very, very heavy price, you know, tough, tough uh, Uncle Joe. And uh, they asked him about that statement, if it still holds. And Biden was like, look, uh, uh, this is before he had a meltdown. He had another meltdown as he was speaking to the media. Just saying. Do whatever the hell they want. I, I, mean, 
I guess I should clear my mind here a little bit and not say what I'm really thinking. But um, before he had his meltdown, he was like, look, uh, we've already placed all these sanctions on Russia and they've already suffered uh, 350,000 casualties in the conflict with Ukraine, whatever the number is, 2,500,000 casualties in Ukraine, whatever. And uh, he's like, they suffered all these sanctions and Russia's in tatters. So they've already suffered these catastrophic consequences. So Biden was like, I told Putin that before the, the conflict. And so they've already suffered these consequences. So basically, Biden was saying that um, his warning to Putin about Navalny doesn't hold. It, 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 it's not relevant today because even though Navalny died, uh, Russia has already suffered catastrophic uh, consequences uh, from the collective West. But... But uh, Biden also said uh, when they asked him about, you know, who who assassinated Navalny, was it Putin? Biden's like, uh, he says, I have no doubt that it was Putin or we have no doubt that Putin did it. But but we don't have any concrete information. <laughs> He's like, we don't we don't really know. He's like, Putin did it, but uh, we don't we don't have any specific information. That was a very interesting statement from uh, from Biden. <laughs> we don't know exactly what happened. That's the, those, that, those are the exact words from Biden. He said, Putin did it, but we don't know exactly what happened. <laughs> it's like, okay. Oh, boy. So, um, yeah, that's what Biden uh, said. And, uh, you know, uh, Yulia Navalny, uh, the, the next... The next uh, opposition leader. I think we, we were introduced to the person that is going to be the opposition for, uh, for Putin. The anti-Putin. The anti-Putin is now going to be Yulia Navalny. And it almost, like she, it almost felt like she was coronated by Nancy Pelosi. Like Nancy Pelosi officially uh, put the crown on, on her head and said, You are now the, the I'm passing the baton off to you because uh, um, Yulia saw Nancy Pelosi and they kissed. And, uh, and it seems like she's going to be the, the opposition. I don't know, is this, Newland's, is, is this part of Newland's big surprise? When she was in Kiev, Newland said that it was going to be a big surprise for, uh, for Russia and for Putin. Is, is this the big surprise? I don't know. She has a, a, Yulia has some organization in London that's set up in London. So it, it looks like they have everything set up. For her to be the opposition in, in exile. Uh, the, the Juan Guaido. The next to Juan Guaido or Svetlana Tikhanovskaya of Belarus. It looks like we've got the, the person. That would be my guess as to what's going on here. Um, yeah, we were introduced to, to who could be the, the potential anti-Putin now. But, um, you know, um, the, the death of Navalny, I, I, I don't know what happened, obviously. I don't know what happened. I say everyone should wait for an investigation and an autopsy. That, that would be my, my line to take. But, um, you know, the, the, the timing of this, um, it, it absolutely erases uh, the, the interview with Tucker Carlson. It, if you were to, to argue that Putin, at least in the eyes of the collective West, got a bump in his... Uh, in his favorability from the Tucker interview that has now been canceled out because now the narrative and everyone's accepting this, even, even, uh, the, the, uh, conservative, let's say like the, the anti-war or conservative libertarian, um, commentators on social media, uh, on YouTube, they just run with the narrative that Putin did it as well. They've just accepted it as well. And, uh, and so I think whatever, whatever good was done from the Tucker interview has now been erased uh, from, from this death. The, the Biden White House, they wasted no time in using the death of Navalny to push for the $61 billion to to Ukraine. So it worked out conveniently for the Biden White House. It's another another way to try and push Congress to approve the 61 billion. Uh, it distracts from Avdevka, I've already said that. It, it distracts from the catastrophe of Avdevka, the defeat of, of uh, NATO, the NATO proxy army in Avdevka. 
Uh, it helped, it definitely helps uh, Elensky in Munich. And, um, and you know, another thing that this does, I was thinking about this, uh, reading various uh, tweets and, and analysis of, of the situation with Navalny and what Biden said during his uh, speech to, to the media. It, um, it brings back the whole Trump Russiagate uh, narrative. Maybe brings back is not the correct word. But I can definitely see listening to, to Biden, listening to, to what the, the neocons and the neoliberals are putting out with, uh, with Navalny. They're definitely creating this Trump-Putin connection again. And they're basically saying that anyone in the Republican Party or in, uh, in America that is a Putin apologist in, in the powers that be, if, if anyone is a Putin apologist, well, then, you know, you're, you're siding with, with the man that just killed Navalny. And all of the, the MAGA Trump crowd that, uh, that romanticizes Putin, well, you're now uh, supporting the man that killed Navalny. And so you can definitely see them using, using this as, as another way to open the door to, to MAGA, America first, Trump connected to Putin and, and all of this stuff again, all of this Russiagate hysteria uh, creeping up again. So I think there's something there. I haven't quite been able to, to put it together, just exactly what they're, what they're going to do from a media perspective, how they're going to utilize this to, to formulate their narratives and their scripts. But you can tell that they're cooking up something between Navalny, Putin killed Navalny, America first, Trump, uh, Trump supporters are sympathetic towards Putin or they want to end the conflict in Ukraine and thus they're apologists for this guy that kills this opposition leader. They're doing something there. So, um, opposition leader. <laughs> you know, anyway, we did a show on the Duran and we talked about Navalny supporting everyone who, who has been following uh, Russia and anyone with, with any kind of kind of knowledge of, of what's going on in the region, they all know that Navalny's popularity was at a maximum during the height of his popularity. Maybe he would poll at two percent. Maybe like ten years ago or fifteen years ago, maybe two percent. And most of that was Moscow and and Saint Petersburg, his support, and that was when he was at the height of his popularity. As, as this corruption blogger, where he made a lot of enemies as a corruption blogger, not only in uh, the government of, 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 Moscow, of, of Russia, but um, you know, he made a lot of en enemies of, of many powerful oligarchs and business people and mafia types as well. So you know, sometimes you, you have to look outside of the government for, for what could have happened. But, um, but yeah, to today, uh, Navalny uh, at this time period in 2023-24 uh, Navalny was just not, uh, a non-entity politically he, he was a, a non-factor right uh, 2% I would say in 2023 Navalny would probably poll at 0. .0002% I mean he, he just wasn't wasn't uh, a political figure of any any substance of any popularity so all of the narratives that you hear from the collective west about how how uh, he was popular in russia those are all lies that's just all fake news anyway you know the possibilities just to wrap things up and then we'll get to avdivka because i've been rambling a bit too much i guess um the possibilities as to as to how he died Let's wait for an investigation. But I, I think if you if you take a step back, I, there's four possibilities. Um, he died of of health issues, and he had a lot of health issues that predate his his time in prison. Uh, this is documented fact that Navalny had a lot of health issues. Uh, he was in Germany, and from what I understand, in Germany, he some things happened in Germany during a certain time period, and who knows. 
Um, you have the narrative that Putin killed him. And then you have the, the narrative that perhaps some uh, three-letter agencies in the West were behind this. And then you have the narrative that, uh, and, and we shouldn't overlook this narrative, that you know, there were some powerful people, oligarchs, mafia types, you know, that were upset with his, his corruption reporting. That's also a possibility. So I don't know what happened. I, I think there's four, four or five possibilities of what could have happened. And uh, it, could, it could have been natural causes. You know, stuff like this does happen and it has been happening a lot uh, recently. So who knows? Uh, qui bono, I say. Qui bono, who benefits? Putin definitely does not benefit from this. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, especially now. Putin, Putin is winning the, he's winning the economic war against the West. He's winning the military war against the West and NATO. He's winning the diplomatic war in, in the world. 80% of the world is, is with Putin. He's, uh, he's, he even scored a huge victory in the media information war with that Tucker Carlson interview. Why, why in God's name would, after all of these victories that Putin is scoring, why in God's name would he wake up in the morning and decide to, to take out Navalny? It doesn't make any sense. Someone who poses zero political threat to Putin. I pose, I pose more of a political threat to Putin than Navalny. And I'm not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating either. <laughs> I pose a bigger political threat to Putin than Navalny. Me running for president of Russia is probably I would probably get more votes. But it um, doesn't make any sense at all. Especially now for Putin to have done this. So I would say out of all the possibilities that I've floated out and maybe there's some more possibilities of what could have happened... I would say that the, the least possible scenario is Putin is behind this. That's the absolute least. And because the collective West and all the leaders came out with their statements so quickly and they reacted so quickly blaming Putin, that actually works in Putin's favor to absolve Putin from, from, this, uh, from this event. If they were, if, if von der Leyen and Michelle and uh, Macron and Biden... If they, if they had even, even a, a small hint that Putin was behind this, they would never have, have put out a tweet 20 minutes after his death was announced saying that Putin did it. They would have waited for the autopsy and the investigation. If they had information which indicated that this could have been some foul play by Putin, they would have waited instead of putting out a statement. The fact that they came out with their statement so quickly actually proves it actually works in Putin's favor to to show that Putin was not behind this. So um you know qui bono I just don't see I just don't see it as as uh as Putin did this. I I, I don't see that as the case. So anyway, uh that's all I have to say with uh with this. Outside of Russia this is a big deal. Um inside of Russia not a big deal. And they tried to get some protests going, but in, uh, in Moscow, and uh, the media was saying big protests in Moscow, and now you have a video coming out showing that these weren't very big protests. Um, they'll, try, they'll, try to, they'll try to build the narrative of, of people in Russia now are upset with, with what happened, but that's not the case. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think you're going to have big protests in in Russia over this incident. If anything, this is, this is going to serve to the benefit of, of Biden and, and the EU and trying to get that $61 billion to Ukraine and canceling out the Tucker interview. It's, it's going to serve those purposes. And, and most importantly, I really think they're going to spin this into, into something to, to throw at Trump. <laughs> elections in the United States, they're going to use this to their favor for the elections. Anyway, I think I've covered everything there. Uh, I don't have anything more to really say. Kamala met with uh, Yulia Navalny. Pelosi met with Yulia Navalny. Ursula met with Yulia Navalny. This is, this is the new uh, anti-Putin Yulia Navalny. I think we're, we've been introduced to her. That's my guess. And that's just a guess. But that is my guess. So, what else should we talk about? Oh, by the way. In 2023, uh, the movie Navalny 
uh, won an Oscar, didn't it? For best documentary. Interesting. Very interesting. I got the Oscar in 2023. I thought I would just point that out. So let's move on. Because I think people are going to get upset with me. Alex, you've been talking about Navalny for 20 minutes. <laughs> I can see the comments down below. Um, I'm not going to... I don't think I'll be covering this story much in the, in the future anyway. So, <laughs> you know, this, this is it. This is the Navalny video. Uh, I talked about Avdivka. This was the big story. Ukraine is retreating. Uh, the Russian military has defeated uh, the, the uh, powerful NATO proxy with massive fortifications built up by NATO over 10 years in Avdevka, and the Russian military has, uh, has defeated this powerful NATO proxy in a very fortified NATO uh, town that was going to be used if you believe some of the analysis and reports was going to be used as the launch pad to, uh, to invade the Donbass, well, no more. Avdevka is, is very soon going to be in the control of the Russian military. The flags have already been raised in, in various uh, uh, government buildings or, or centers, uh, Locations in the city center in uh, Avdevka, they've already raised the Russian flag. Sirsky has already said that he's going to try to retreat whatever troops he can retreat out of there. Uh, this is a huge loss for uh, NATO, huge loss for Alensky. Sirsky is one week into his, his tenure as commander-in-chief, and this is a massive loss. Sirsky's popularity is, is not so good. It wasn't so good coming into the, uh, the position as commander of the armed forces, and this is not going to help. Uh, there was a poll in Kiev that was conducted, and it had Sirsky's popularity at something at like 40%. He's not very trusted by uh, people in Ukraine, and uh, Zaluzhny's popularity was, was like at something like at 90%, just to give you an idea as to how popular Zaluzhny was and is, and how unpopular Sirsky is. So losing Avdevka is not going to, to help Sirsky at all. So the, that, that is the big news, though. The big news is Avdevka. And there's really not much to say, but other than Russia has won. They've won uh, this big battle, this big fight. And uh, from what I understand, uh, Avdevka was the big fortified city. There's, there are fortifications to the west of Avdevka, but nothing like Avdevka. So this is a big, big deal, a very big deal. And that's why NATO and the collective West are absolutely freaking out. So um, Lavrov was speaking at an event, the 10th anniversary of the coup in Kiev. That was what this event was in Moscow. And Lavrov said... Uh, in his statements that the UK is more hostile than the US. An interesting statement from Lavrov. I think I actually have a quote, a quote here from Lavrov. The role that the UK is playing in the current event is, of course, even more aggressive, more elaborate in its provocative assertiveness than of any other participant, including even the US. Interesting message, an interesting warning from Lavrov to the UK. Lavrov also said that the EU, they, uh, they are trying to supply, they want to, and they're trying to supply weapons and long-range missiles to hit at the heart of Russia. He said that this narrative about uh, the collective West and about Europe, the EU is, is only arming Kiev and they're not a party to this conflict, he says. That is a lie. He says, we all know that's a lie. And he says that the Russian government, they have information uh, where they claim that uh, Europe, the EU, is absolutely trying to find a way to get the long-range weapons to Kiev, as well as providing the surveillance and, uh, and uh, the targeting that is needed to hit at the heart of Russia. That is the, the words that Lavrov used. They, they want to sow chaos and panic inside of Russia. 
Uh, this is the European Union, and so they want to try to figure out a way to, to get the long-range missiles to Kiev and then provide the intel and uh, whatever other um, support and help that they have to provide the Ukraine military in order to hit inside of Russia, in order to sow chaos and panic. And of course, the, the narrative is always sow chaos and panic in order to regime change Putin. Like Yulia Navalny said, uh, Putin, Putin is going to be regime change soon, or Putin's going to see justice soon. This is all about regime change of, of Putin. Everything is all about trying to regime change Putin. And you know what? Uh, if you take a step back and look at the situation with the conflict in Ukraine and the Russian military, what they're doing to the Ukraine military, what they're doing to NATO weapons, what they're doing to NATO mercenaries, what they're doing to, to the most powerful NATO proxy, the only chance that they absolutely have is to regime change Putin. That's it. That's the only chance that they have. Um, everything else they've lost, military, economic, uh, diplomatic, they've lost on everything. And so the only opportunity, the only chance that they have to to win this thing is to try and regime change Putin. So, I mean, that's that's it. Um, Lavrov also was asked about whether Trump, a Trump victory can, in the U.S. elections, if it can mend U.S.-Russia relations. And this is what Lavrov, he said, and I quote, that is their problem. We have made so many concessions, gestures of goodwill, that our reserves have been exhausted. The only gesture we've seen from them in response to our good deeds was made with one hand. So basically Lavrov is saying, look, even if Trump wins and even if he says that he can, that he would like to mend relations with Russia, he's like, it's on them. We've, we've made many, many gestures and we've, uh, we've tried to, to find a diplomatic way out of this for many, many years from the Minsk agreements to, to everything else that we know. We've tried over and over again to solve these problems in a diplomatic uh, way and you know we haven't we haven't seen the same goodwill from from our partners in the collective west like like russia likes to call them our partners and he's like it's up to them now so some interesting statements from lavrov and in uh, germany before the munich security conference got underway we had an agreement signed between Alensky and Schultz between Germany and Ukraine, a security agreement. Basically, the security agreement says that uh, Ukraine and Germany are now connected for 10 years. Germany has signed up to take care of Ukraine for 10 years. Weapons, training of troops, money to, to keep their economy afloat. For the next 10 years, Germany has promised to take care of Ukraine. And you know what this agreement really is? It's basically Germany saying we will take care of the government in exile for the next 10 years, or we'll take care of whatever is left of Ukraine, the west of Ukraine for 10 years. That's what this is. Germany is going to be the, the EU sponsor of Ukraine going forward, whatever, whatever that means. We don't know. Whatever Russia decides that to mean. So, uh, yeah, Germany's on the hook for 10 years with this agreement. Financially, militarily, socially. It's now Germany's, Germany's problem now. Germany has, has bought this problem. They decided to buy this problem. And they signed up to, to purchasing this problem. So let's do some, uh, some pre-clown worlds and we'll get to our clown worlds. Uh, by the way, Brussels Euroclear that's holding the Russian assets. They sent out a warning. Once again, don't uh, steal these assets. <laughs> Euroclear warns against G7 plan to backstop Ukraine debt with Russian assets. Chief Executive Lieve Mostre says move would trigger similar risks to European financial system as outright seizure. Basically, she's saying if you steal these assets, the world is going to see it as, as stealing, so don't do it. So you have another warning, this time coming from Euroclear. Uh, we had the judgment in another Trump case, the New York case. Judge Engeron, this guy, this New York judge, Arthur Engeron, he has ordered former President Donald Trump to pay $364 million for allegedly defrauding banks in order to acquire loans and other benefits 
loans which the banks themselves testified they were satisfied with after doing their own due diligence. Yeah, this is the first crime in history where the banks were paid in full. No one was was scammed. No one was cheated. <laughs> um, all the loans were paid. The banks made money. Everyone made money. This is the first crime in history where everyone made money. No one was cheated. No loans were in default. None of that stuff. And uh, and they still find Trump guilty of something. <laughs> I don't even know what. The banks are happy. The banks are, we made money from this guy. We're happy to do business with Trump. <laughs> We're very happy to do business with Trump. And uh, they found him guilty. Yeah, we know what this is all about. We know that they're just trying to build this narrative about Trump. He loves Putin. Putin kills uh, his political opposition. And, you know, Navalny, one, someone said that Navalny is like the next uh, Nelson Mandela. I think that was Michael McFowl said Navalny is Nelson Mandela. I was like, really? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so that's how they're trying to build up Navalny. So uh, Trump is friends with, with Putin, and, and uh, Putin kills the opposition, and Trump has been indicted 500 times, and he was found guilty uh, in New York, and he owes $364 million for fraud. We see the game that they're playing. Let's do some, uh, some clown worlds. Oh, one more story. Egypt is ditching the U.S. dollar in trade with the BRICS. So another country is starting to de-dollarize. Keep an eye out for Egypt. Uh, the, the powers that be in Washington are not going to be happy with Egypt. Uh, so, and of course, there's a lot going on in and around Egypt. So just keep that in mind. Let's see. Clown worlds. CNN got excited with the, the death of Navalny. You know, the narrative of the death of Navalny. They got very excited with that. And they actually put out... Um, uh, they put out a, a lower third, what's it called, the, 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 the scrolling text, and it said, it said, world leaders point to Putin after reported death of Putin. <laughs> they actually got a little too, too excited and messed that one up, and actually put after the reported death of Putin. Okay, that's coming from CNN. And you have this, uh, this video of, of uh, the, the Pentagon briefing. I don't know if you guys saw this. The Pentagon briefing that took place the other day. And in the briefing, one of the reporters, this had to be a joke, but one of the reporters asked the Pentagon spokesman about this Russian uh, nuclear shovels and washing machines in space. And uh, he also said... Is this, is this like GoldenEye? Is this like the James Bond movie GoldenEye? Or should we be uh, signing up with the, with the Wolverines? <laughs> so uh, take a look at the video. This is real. This is not a deep fake or anything like that. At least not from what I gather. This is a real question from a real reporter. Obviously, he's joking around, but it left the Pentagon spokesman speechless. But uh, this, is, this is clown world, everybody. This is clown world from this uh, Russia nukes in space shooting down satellites uh nonsense anyway that's the video everybody the duran.locals.com we are on rumble odyssey bit you telegram rockfin and twitter x duran shop 15 percent off all t-shirts take care thank you i know this may be a question for soviet premier putin but the god-awful thing that the russians want to put into space is it like goldeneye the thing from the 1995 bond movie and is the is it time for all of us on the ground to join Jed and the Wolverines? <laughs> Jeff, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, I guess we just have to live and let die. <laughs> all right.